Well, it's great to be here. Yeah, I, I think we went American because I think you guys were needing a break from all of the foreign food when we went out for dinner. So, uh, yeah, we, in fact, we were on the plane because I was flying back to the States. So we were on the plane ride uh, all the way over from the Philippines back to Kansas City. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And it's exciting to just uh, get to visit in and um, just first of all, just to thank you so much uh, for your support of our ministry. We're so we're so grateful that you support our family. Um, I believe you took us on about four years ago. And, and so we're, we're grateful that you're a partner of us and, and help us serve God in the Philippines. Um, I think the next slide has a picture of our family. This is my wife, Nikki. And uh, I grew up in Hutchinson, Kansas, so I'm, I'm a Kansas boy. I, I love the state of Kansas. I love the people of Kansas. I'm from Hutchinson. My wife's from Kansas City. Missouri side, but we won't hold that against her. And, uh, and so, you know, we, this, is our, this is our part of the country. We love um, churches that are out here serving God and, and sharing the gospel in this part of the world. That's my son Desmond. He is six years old. And my daughter Amelia. And so they're just growing up so fast. And, and our family just loves getting to serve God there in the Philippines. Um, we've been in the Philippines for about two terms now. Um, we went over as basically team missionaries, intern missionaries. We worked uh, working alongside uh, Mark and Jessica and uh, Jessica's father, Greg Lyons, and the ministry there, part of Global Surge. And as Caleb said, we've been working with BBCA. Uh, if you skip ahead a few pictures... Um, yeah, there we are. We've been in Metro Manila, which um, is just a massive city. I never pictured myself living in such a, a massive place, but it has about 22 million people that living in Metro Manila now. Just huge. And you just can't even imagine what it's like to be in such a massive, um, just metropolitan area with so many people crammed there. But the blessing is there's just such a great access to bring the gospel to people, to plant churches, to see people reach with the gospel. The Philippines is predominantly a Catholic country. Uh, if you, it, um, you know, since the Spanish colonial period. And so they brought over Catholicism. So most Filipinos would nominally, at least, if not devoutly, identify themselves as Catholic, we're constantly surrounded and bombarded by images of, of Jesus, of the cross, and yet most of these Filipinos, you know, if you asked them, if you were to die, would, would you go to heaven? They'd say, most of them would say, yeah, I think so, because I'm, I mostly have done good things. I'm, I'm mostly a good person. They, they don't understand the gospel. They don't understand that it's not about what we do. It's about what Christ has done. And so what's, the blessing is we don't have to usually begin with a Filipino convincing him that God exists. We just have to open up the Bible and share what the Bible actually says about Jesus Christ and begin to um, open up God's word to them, which is why there is such a just a massive um, just outreach going on in the Philippines. So many people turning to Christ, but... They are mostly, these, in their Catholicism, it's very animistic, it's very ritualistic, it's very superstitious. And so they live in fear. They live in just trying to seek God's favor, trying to get him to pay attention to them, to, to bless them. To, I think in the next picture you can see they, they buy statues of, uh, and idols, they buy candles to pray, help in their prayers, to ask God for money, for romance, for what blessing and healing. And so they're just trapped in a system where they don't realize that what they need is Jesus, not rituals and superstitions. And so, um, you know, we get to open up God's word and share that with them. In the next picture, you'll see um, we've been blessed to, while in the Philippines, help with two churches. Um, during our two terms there, our first term, we helped plant a church. And we started out actually in a parking lot, gravel parking lot. And uh, by that point, you can see we had some tents, but initially, and then eventually we moved to an uh, apartment complex, but initially we had no tents, and it rained. It, we have a rainy season that lasts for about three months, and so you can imagine how challenging it was. Um, you know, there's times where we'd see some of the, you know, rain would start, and we'd have wires on the ground. They're now in like six inches of water. We'd see rats running around out there. It was a, it was a crazy experience, but you know what? God blessed we were able to help that church get started. 
and um, see it. I believe in the next picture you can see it. we were able to help mentor um, our worship leader and his wife, Gerald and Rizelle. And they were students of mine in BBCA. And now Gerald is pastoring that church. They just had their first child uh, last month. And uh, just strongly serving God and helping to lead people to Christ in their community. And then this past term, we helped with another church and another former student of mine, uh, Joel Sueso and his wife, Den. And uh, we were meeting on the third floor of this little tiny building. And, uh, you know, you can see that's about as wide as it is. And it's not much longer lengthwise. And we would pack that thing out. Um, last year um, for Christmas, we just really reached out to the community. And we probably had 70 people packed in that thing, uh, standing room only. I was afraid the floor would cave. But, uh, you know, so we, we were blessed to help and assist Pastor Joel there in, in the church. And, and I, again, I mostly... Um, helped him. I'd fill in and preach and, and kind of mentored and assisted him. But the blessing is having Filipinos who are trained up in Bible college, being taught God's word, we're able to raise them up as leaders. And so I was able to work alongside him. I think the next picture you'll see me and him. Oh, Desmond. Desmond loved getting to be there in the church. And he made fast friends with some of those other kids. And literally our s- s- children's area was the second floor landing in the building outside of an internet cafe. That's about all the space we had, but that's, that's what we were using for our children's program. We just had to make do with what we had, and, and there's myself and Pastor Joel. And the next page, you can see us um, celebrating basically what you're doing all month. That's not his wife. That's actually another student of mine, Lareza, who is now a missionary in Cambodia. And so we had her in, and we're we're doing what you're doing. We're helping to send her out to, to, as a missionary, helping her to go out, as Mark was sharing, to go out to another country and take the gospel forward. And so that's just the joy uh, of the Philippines is that it's not just a destination for the gospel. We're helping the gospel go out and beyond where we are. Um, Nikki as well has been faithfully serving and assisting in the next picture, leading small group studies with women and, and other pastors' wives in the Philippines. Oh, I try not there yet. And then uh, as Caleb was sharing, I was helping with BBCA teaching in this past term. I was registrar. And so it's a joy to get to be able to teach and raise up Filipinos. We have a picture of the graduation from uh, uh, last year and uh, right there. And so that's been a big part of my passion is teaching and training Filipinos. Um, as I said, Nikki has been uh, training f- women as well and assisting and preparing them to lead in the church. And so that's really our heartbeat. You can go ahead a couple pictures more. And there's Nikki. And go one more as well. Now, as we go back to the Philippines this next term, uh, you can go to the next picture. Um, you know, our goal, it remains the same, but we're actually kind of going through a bit of a transition and, and, and embarking on some new endeavors. But our goal remains the same. It's to multiply disciples, to multiply leaders, and to multiply churches there in the Philippines, especially through training Filipinos for ministry. And we've been blessed to work alongside the Buxtons and BBCA these past two terms. But God's placed on my heart just to burn to help another school um, in a different part of Metro Manila and begin helping them as well in their endeavors to train up Filipinos for ministry. So I think on the next picture, you can see a picture of that. Uh, So I'll be teaching at the Center for Biblical Studies Institute and Seminary and assisting them as they continue to strengthen their teaching program. Um, You know, 22 million people, we've got a lot of work to do, and, and we just need to raise up more Filipinos to continue to go out and serve God as pastors and church planners and missionaries. And so we'll be relocating our family. We actually moved out of our house before we came back for this uh, furlough. And so we'll be finding a new home and relocating and serving here in this uh, new part of the city. And so we're looking forward to that. And Nikki has some new endeavors as well as we return um, on the next picture um, Nikki graduated with a degree in art, and her passion has always been art. And so she tries to find ways to use her art to communicate God's word. Um, she's many times been at Starbucks there in the Philippines working on art and has been able to begin just a gospel conversation with people, just asking about what she's drawing and, and what she's doing. And if you look at the next page uh, slide, there's another picture of a print she did recently. That's not painted. That She literally carved that out. 
in a rubber thing that she could roll it and stamp in ink and make prints. And so she um, has been working on that, trying to communicate God's word through her art. And so as we go back, she will actually be teaching art as a high school art teacher at Faith Academy, where our children will be attending school. And through that ministry, on the next slide, you can see a picture of the school. But they service, um, I want to say, how many nationalities, Nikki? 32 nationalities um, in the school. So not just Americans, not just Filipinos, but Indians, Koreans. And um, although it started out primarily for missionary kids, um, you know, business people send their kids there, um, expats, all sorts of people in the community. And so she'll get to minister to other missionary kids and uh, invest in them. But she'll also get to minister to you know, all sorts of, of people who are attending this school um, and get to use her art to um, just serve them and, and uh, work alongside them. So she's excited about that. We're excited for her to have that opportunity as well to, um, to serve God in that capacity as we go back. And so we're looking forward to all of that. As we um, get into our message today, I have a little bit of time um, to share God's word with you. And I want to challenge you. And, and the tough thing is, I know this is just a passionate, mission-minded church. You know the Great Commission. You know the need to take the gospel out into the world, if you'll go to the next slide. And, um, and so, you know, I know you know all of that. In fact, my first experience with your church was probably 15 years ago. Um, I was attending community college, and my youth pastor was coming out here to speak at a youth outreach your church was doing, and he brought me along. I don't know if any of you remember this. I think it was about 15 years ago, and you guys were doing some kind of beach party outreach in Main Street. And I think you shut down the road, and there's like sand in the street and volleyball, and there's a concert. I don't, does anybody remember this? I'm not just, I didn't dream this, right? Some of you experienced this, right? And so I came out with my youth pastor. And so that's actually my first acquaintance with your church um, all that time ago. And, and so from the start, it's clear this is a church that, ha- that has a heartbeat for reaching your community and reaching the world with the gospel. And so um, as, we, as we turn to God's word, I want to challenge us. And I'm going to go to maybe an unusual place uh, that you wouldn't be expecting. But I want you to turn to your Bibles into Second Chronicles chapter 29. And we'll... As you can see there, we'll kind of give an overview of three chapters. I promise I won't go long. I know we got a big game tonight. You know, we'll just, maybe like another hour or two, and we can cover these three cha- Is that okay? And, no? Okay. I'll go a little quicker than that. Um, but I want to look at this passage because, you know what? What I love about God's Word is, as Paul writes in Second Timothy, all of it is God-breathed. All of it is inspired. All of it is profitable for us. Um, and beneficial for us to study and, and take in. And uh, my missions professor back in Bible college, he, lo- he loved to say that the God of the Old Testament is a missionary God. The Christ of the Gospels is a missionary Christ. The Spirit of Acts is a missionary spirit. God wants to reach people. And that's always been his plan. It wasn't something new invented in the New Testament. We'll see in Second Chronicles that he loves and desires those who will work diligently as his messenger of, of forgiveness and redemption. So we're going to look at a king named Hezekiah. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Chronicles, this is long after the time of King David, the kingdom of Israel, God's people have split. They had a civil basically a civil war, a bit of a a disjunction. And they split into northern and southern kingdom. And so the northern kingdom, as you read about them, and every king they had was wicked. Every king in the north led them deeper and deeper into idolatry, into rejecting God. In the south, as we read about the southern kingdom, the kingdom that is still being led by the line of David, his, his descendants... See, it's kind of a mixed bag. Sometimes you have a good king who leads the people to worship God, and sometimes you have a bad king who leads the people away, and it kind of goes around in a cycle. And it's been doing this for now about 200 years since the time of David and Solomon when Hezekiah comes onto the scene. 
I want to begin, I just want to begin by looking at chapter 29 and looking at some of the first few verses in that chapter. But we're going to see how God used Hezekiah to bring great revival, spiritual revival to the, the people in, in his care. It says in verse 1, Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And skipping to verse 2, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. See, Hezekiah, from the start, he purposed in his heart that he was going to be diligent about serving God and, to, and leading people to worship God. And um, what's phenomenal about this is there is no reason whatsoever that we should expect this to have happened with Hezekiah. In the previous chapter, if you look at his father Ahaz, Ahaz was one of the worst kings of Judah. He literally boarded up the temple of God, sold all of the gold, and sent it to foreign armies trying to buy them to help protect the nation. He placed altars on the, every street corner for people to worship however they wanted. All sorts of idolatry worship introduced. In fact, he even engaged in child sacrifice. He sacrificed one of his own children to a, a false god trying to seek its favor for their nation. He completely rejected God, completely abandoned all of that. And that's the home life that Hezekiah had grown up in, the atmosphere he was raised up in. He wasn't raised up by a father who loved God, taught him God's word, showed him how to follow and obey God. He, he was raised in a completely anti-God atmosphere. And yet, we see here, it says, on the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Clearly, something happened in his life before he became king. Now, most likely, it was is the fact that during his father's reign, Isaiah, the prophet, came and said to his father, if you will just reject these idols and turn to God, he'll forgive you. He'll protect you. He'll rescue you. His father didn't listen. But I think we have enough evidence to see that Hezekiah clearly had experienced a transformation prior to becoming king. He had studied God's word. And prepared and purposed in his heart that he wanted to be diligent about the things of God. He wanted to be diligent about serving God and leading people to follow God. And so it says, in the first year of his reign, the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And he speaks to the priests in verse 4. He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them in the east square. These are the people who should have been leading them in worship of God. And yet they completely capitulated under his father, and he tells them, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves. Sanctify the house of the Lord, God of your fathers, and carry out the rubbish from the holy place. For fathers have trespassed and done evil in the eyes of the Lord our God. And skipping down, in verse 8, it says, Therefore the wrath of the Lord fell upon us, upon Judah and Jerusalem. He has given them up to trouble, to desolation, and to jeering, as you see for your eyes. In verse 10, it says, Now is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that you should minister to him and burn incense. Hezekiah was an unlikely king, and yet he decided from the beginning that he would begin personally, serving God, and he would call others to serve God. He called, he repented, and he called others to repentance. He instructs the priests of what they are to do, and as you continue through the chapter, they clean up the temple, they open it up, they prepare it for worship. They begin offering sacrifices to God and renewing worship. They open up the book of Psalms and began singing to God. And the Levites and the priests completely follow him. They, they're on board, and they turn and, and seek after God alongside him. He's able to raise up these leaders who would be able to assist him in leading the nation back to God. And so in the next slide, we'll see that I've got nine points I'll quickly cover as we go through here. But we see here, well, kind of came out small, but diligent messengers of the king... We see here, first of all, that they submit themselves to God. 
If we want to be diligent about the things of God, if we want to be a messenger for Jesus Christ, we need to submit ourselves to God like Hezekiah did. He turned, he repented, he submitted himself to the Lord. We also need to repent and call others to repentance. In our day and age, that's a tough thing, right? Nobody wants to hear they're a sinner. In fact, more and more, there's just intense pressure on us as Christians that we're small-minded, that we're ignorant, that we're bigoted if we say there's anything wrong about how somebody else is living. It's very much like the days of at the book of Judges where everybody does what is right in their own eyes. But if we want to be diligent messengers for Christ, we need to repent. We need to call others to repentance. We need to lead them to understand that God is holy. He is just. He is righteous. But he's also merciful and gracious, ready to forgive when we turn to him in repentance. And we need to not neglect our duties if we're to be diligent messengers for Christ, for the king. He, call, he told them, and that's really the opposite of diligence, right? Negligence. Either we're diligently working or we're neglecting the role and responsibility Christ has given us. He has called us to go and make disciples, to baptize people into God's church, to teach them all things that God's word commands. And so we need to not neglect what God has called us to do. We live in a day and age where we're constantly bombarded by distractions. Let us not be negligent, but like Hezekiah, be diligent in the things of God, to be good messengers for him. Skipping ahead to chapter 30, we see that the revival begins in Jerusalem and people respond. But Hezekiah is not content with that. He's not content just with his own city or even his own country that he leads. He's looking outwards and beyond the borders of his, of his, of his territory. It says in verse 1 of chapter 30, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh. That's the northern kingdom. They've been split off for 200 years. They've been at war many times. In fact, one of Hezekiah's brothers died in warfare against the north. And yet he, sends, he says he writes letters to them that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. And skipping to verse 5, it says, So they resolved to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan. That's, the nor- again, the northern kingdom. Not his territory, not his place to rule. He could be provoking a fight with them by doing this. Enraging their king, but instead he decides to send a proclamation that they should come to keep the Passover of the Lord, God of Israel, at Jerusalem, since they had not done it for a long time in the prescribed manner. Verse 6, Then the runners went throughout all Israel and Judah with the letters from the king and his leaders, and spoke according to the command of the king. Children of Israel returned to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And skipping down to verse 8, Now do not be stiff-necked or stubborn as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and enter his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. And serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Verse 9, For if you return to the Lord, your brethren and your children will be treated with compassion by those who lead them captive, so that they may come back to this land. For your Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and he will not turn his face from you. If you return to him. So his heart was to call not just his own people, but to look outward at the lost beyond his borders and say, they, they need to hear this. They need to repent and turn to God. We need to welcome them back in the fold. Let bygones be bygones. Forget about the bad blood. And we need to invite them back to worship God and seek his repentance. He had a, a missionary heart. He was looking outwards and with compassion that all would hear the message of, of, of God and would turn to him and experience his forgiveness. And it's the same kind of missionary heart that needs to be inside of all of us. That we will look out as we go about our day. Going to the grocery store, the gas station. We're crossing paths with people at school and at work who need to hear Jesus Christ. 
We need to have a heart that beats compassion for them and a desire to draw them into the fold that they would hear the message of Christ. And outwards across the world to look at the nations and realize there are so many people who still yet need to hear about who Jesus Christ is and what he did for them on the cross. You know what? That's not an easy task, right? In fact, we see that in verse 10. If you look at the next slide, it wasn't easy then either. It says, So the runners passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun, but they laughed at them and mocked them. You know what? Sometimes we're going to share the gospel. People are going to laugh and mock, right? We're fearful of that, right? But what it should do is hurt us. Hurt to know that what they're mocking is the very hope they need. But you know what? Verse 11 says, Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Some people will mock, but some people will respond. Let's not be fearful to share because they're not going to respond if we're not really willing to endure some mocking. We have to be willing to share and not be held back by fear. I speak this as someone who experiences fear. I don't speak this as someone who's always courageous about sharing the gospel. I speak this to myself as well. But it says, verse 12, also the hand of God was on Judah to give them singleness of heart to obey the command of the king and the leaders at the word of the Lord. And so we see here three more points we can learn and apply if we want to be diligent messengers of the king. On the next slide, first of all, oh, we'll go ahead and skip to the next slide. Skip to the next one. It says, um, proclaim the good news. We need to proclaim. Just like he sent messengers out to proclaim the good news. Come and seek forgiveness. Come and return to God. We need to proclaim the good news if we're going to be diligent messengers of the king. We need to persevere against opposition, as we already said. And we need to, lastly, work by the power of the Holy Spirit. It said there in that last verse, none of this transpired because Hezekiah was charismatic or because he was the most persuasive or because he is the most holy or righteous. It all happened, it said, by the power of God working in the hearts of the people. Hezekiah was obedient. He was diligent to serve God. But he had no guarantee the people would listen and follow. In fact, his grandfather, Jotham, attempted a revival, and nobody followed him. It says Hezekiah couldn't take credit for any of of this revival. It was all completely by the power of the Spirit working in the hearts of the people. And that's the, that's the actual freeing aspect of sharing the gospel is it's not about us. Sometimes we're afraid, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I mess up? What if I offend them and they're, they won't want anything to do with God afterwards? It's not about anything we do. It's not about us other than being obedient to share and proclaim the message. It's completely by the power of the Holy Spirit that the seed takes root and grows and produces fruit in their lives. We're just called to sow the seed. And that frees us up that we don't have to worry about how, how good of a presentation did I do? How eloquent was I? Did I know all the right verses? Did I say the right words? We just need to trust that the Spirit is working through his word, when we share it. And be diligent to share as a result. So we see Hezekiah sent heralds out. I want us to look at one last passage. If you'll skip ahead to chapter, later in chapter 30, verse 17, it says this. For there were many in this, um, or verse 18, chapter 30, verse 18. For a multitude of the people, many from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulon, They came for the Passover. They hadn't cleansed themselves, though, it says. 
And yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord provide atonement for everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord, God of his fathers, though he is not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah and healed the people. If you'll go to the next slide, we see three final points we can learn from this passage. Um, I try, let, and we see here at the end of chapter 31 that thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God, and every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandment to seek his God, he did it with all his heart, and so he prospered. And so three final points we can learn from, from this passage and seeing Hezekiah's revival is we need to, first of all, embrace all who come to faith. See, Hezekiah welcomed them all in, he welcomed in the people from the north. In fact, it says that there were foreigners who came in who were from the, either the northern kingdom or southern kingdom of, of Judah or Israel. But there were foreigners who were living in the land who also came. They welcomed them in because they came seeking forgiveness from God. And that's the beauty of it is all people from all nations, all languages, tribes, ethnicities, all are welcome before God. We need to embrace all who come to faith and welcome them into the family. We need to intercede in prayer for others. So we saw that not all of them had knew yet how to follow God properly. They didn't obey all of the rules. They'd been far away from God for too long. They didn't know what the, the scriptures said. And so they didn't necessarily do all of the right things. But Hezekiah didn't condemn them. He was patient with them, and he prayed for them. He knew he had a responsibility to teach them and raise them up in God's word. And in all things, he wholeheartedly sought God. And we too, if we're to be diligent for the things of God, we need to wholeheartedly seek God and not allow the things of this world to distract us from the eternal glory of serving God and his gospel. Hezekiah is important because, and this links us back to the New Testament, because in many ways, Hezekiah was a type of, of Christ. He's an example of, of Christ who had yet to come. God had promised David that one of his sons, one of his descendants, would one day rule forever. And we see in the story of Hezekiah, he was a good king. In fact, it says in the parallel passage in Second Kings, he was the best king since David. No other king before or after him followed God as wholeheartedly as Hezekiah. And yet, if you continue this story, he wasn't perfect. He made mistakes just like David did and like we do. He had some mess-ups, and he eventually died. He wasn't the king to come who would reign forever, but he pointed to that king. And although he ushered in a temporary revival and worship of God, Christ came to be the ultimate king, to reign forever, to usher in us to worship God eternally. And just like Hezekiah sent out messengers to proclaim that message, we too are called by our king to go out as messengers. In fact, I want to end with this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 21. It says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, we, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. We know him spiritually. We've been born again. We've been given spiritual life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. But behold, all things have become new. Christ has renewed us. He's transformed us. He's remade us. And because of that, it says in verse 18, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are his messengers, sent out, just like Hezekiah sent out messengers throughout the kingdoms to declare, come back and and come to God, repent, 
and seek his forgiveness. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Right there we get in the gospel in a nutshell. He saved us. As Scott was saying earlier, he saved us to put us on mission, to be ambassadors, messengers of good news, to go out and share the hope we have. The beautiful thing is every one of us sits here today because somebody came to us, right? Now maybe some, for the kids, if you're like me, my parents were already attending church when I was born, so they kind of brought me in. But you know what? Even, the, even still... I came to faith because somebody, my Awana teacher, when I was nine years old, came to me and shared the gospel. Every one of us sits here today because somebody came to us as a messenger, as an ambassador of Christ, carrying the ministry of reconciliation to us so that we could be born again, so that we could have redemption in Christ. And we've been sent out with that mission as well. So as we close today, I just want to thank you so much that you're a church that values God's mission. I want to challenge us to renew our commitment and our, com- our com- commitment to the Great Commission to take the gospel to all people and to have a compassionate heart that looks out on the world and sees the great need for all to come to Christ and seek forgiveness. I'll pray and I'll turn it over to Caleb. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you've saved us, that you sent your son to this earth to bear the punishments for our sins, our sins on his his body, on the cross. We thank you that you raised him from the dead so that we could be renewed in hope, so we could be transformed and given new life, spiritual life through him and have a relationship with you, Lord, adopted into your family. I pray that we would not be negligent, but that we'd be diligent messengers on your behalf, sharing the good news we've received and compelled to go out with the ministry of reconciliation, drawing people to you by the power of your spirit, trusting in you and not in ourselves, knowing that we are weak, we are fearful, but you are mighty. You're mighty to save, and you will use us for your glory. Planting the seed of the gospel in people's hearts and drawing them to you, Lord. We thank you that we get to serve you and be on mission with you. I pray we'd be blessed as we continue our day worshiping you together. In Jesus' name, amen.